Hi guys, let's get started. We're going to talk about the, the um, chapter one in your textbook, the five foundations of economics. If you have any questions, uh, send me an email. Uh, do not leave a message underneath the video because I don't check that. Okay, I hate to see myself in the videos. So uh, email me for questions. All right, so let's get started. So the five foundation of economics. This is like a uh, like a preview of everything uh, you will learn in the later chapters. So it's not a it's not a hard chapter, uh, but it does have little tricky stuff here and there. So let's get started. Okay. Um, all right, so the five foundation of economics. Uh, let's don't need this. All right, so um, the first thing you will learn in any economic class is something called a scarcity. So scarcity basic is uh, basically is is the limited nature of society's given resource uh, and also society's uh, unlimited wants. So uh, so let me let me just throw a question out there. Um, does anybody want a free house, like a free? You don't pay anything for it. Um, so four bedrooms, two car garage, uh, three bathrooms, big front yard, big backyard. Anything you need is all in the in the house. Or well, you want it for free? I mean, call, of course we will, right? And then imagine if President Trump says, um, if everybody vote for him again, um, um, and then he's reelected, and then in twenty twenty he will give everybody in America a free house just like that. Now, would that be possible? Now, I'm not saying uh, how how reliable President Trump is. I'm asking that does our society have enough resource to produce a house like that for everybody in America in a given time period? Probably not, right? We don't have enough lumbers. We don't have enough bricks. We don't have enough foundations. We don't have enough laborers to produce that many houses for everybody in America. So we have this thing called an unlimited wants. Right? We, we always want more stuff. But the problem is that we have a limited resource. So that's called scarcity. Is that when you have this condition with limited resource, try to satisfy unlimited wants, that's called scarcity. And then economics is the study of how uh, societies or group of peoples um, allocate the limited resource to satisfy their, their, their unlimited wants. So basically, it's just how if each individual society is dealing with their uh, scarcity problem. Now, um, every resource is scarce, but you know you do have a few resources here and there that's not scarce. Now, for example, um, air is not scarce, um, but clean air is scarce. Now, um, water is not scarce, especially during Hurricane Harvey. <laughs> water was definitely not scarce, um, but clean air is scarce. Okay, so so we have this um, abundance of resources, you know, here and there, not that many, but most of the resources we have in, in the economy, uh, they're all scarce. That we don't have enough of them. Okay, so economics, which is study how people dealing with the scarce resource and their unlimited desire. All right, um, so there are two um, basically study for economics: um, the microeconomics and our class, the macroeconomics. So micro is study of the economy on the smaller scale, uh, so like a micro, right? Small. So for microeconomics, we study individual business, individual consumer, individual market. Uh, that's the mi microeconomics. Macroeconomics is um, the big picture. So look at the entire economy. Um, factors such as inflation, uh, real GDPs, uh, unemployment. Uh, so those are affecting the entire economy. That's the big picture over here. Okay. So and then uh, this is 2301. And then if you guys anybody want to go further, um, this is 2302. So they're um, they're there's they're they're all economics, but just look at different area of the economy. Um, and then to be honest with you, 2302 is a little bit easier um, because it's focused on a smaller scale. But for those of you who's already here for 2001, uh, you have no choice. You gotta finish this one first. Okay. All right. So the um, so five foundations are uh, incentive matters. Um, life about life is all about trade off, opportunity cost, marginal thinking, and then trade create values. So incentives. So what is incentive? Incentive is something that motivate you to do something. Uh, so for example, uh, if you go to a store and then there's a big poster that says for sale. Now what is that? That is an incentive because that would we, we, we intense uh, uh, our consumers to go into the store to buy stuff. So that will be called a positive incentive. Uh, a normative incentive that will be uh, something that, that discourage you from doing something. Now, for example, um, the risk of getting a speeding ticket that will be a negative incentive. Okay, because we don't want to get a ticket, therefore we, we drive under the speed limit. But you know, everybody just go to the five, like a five miles over speed limit. Okay. But you know what, guys? Um, if you guys ever have a chance to go travel uh, to France, 
in France, uh, their speed limit is strictly enforced. That if you're just one mile over the limit, you get a ticket for it. And you wouldn't even know it because for their um, men, on their highways, um, most of it, they're uh, enforced by uh, those speeding cameras. So they're working automatically. Uh, once you speed, get the camera catch you and you get a little ticket in the mail. Okay, so that's why if you if you ever go to France, if you ever drive on the highway, you notice like everybody going exactly the same speed. So nobody can pass anybody else. Because if you do, that means you're speeding and then you get a ticket automatically, okay? So that will be a negative in incentive for everybody to drive safely. Um, there are also um, different between direct and the indirect incentive. So direct is just like a verbal command. Like a, um, you do this, uh, I tell you to do what, what to do, that's a direct incentive. Uh, indirect, um, it's like a, uh, how should I put this? Um, it's like a byproduct of another action. Um, so for example, um, that I tell you guys, um, well, let's suppose uh, we all know that uh, drinking soft drinks is bad for us, and then what do we do? We drink um, more water instead, right? So this incentive to drink more water, not because water is good, but because soft drink is bad, that it will be called an indirect incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, that one incentive have impact on the other incentive, okay? Um, now, unintended consequences is very similar to uh, this indirect incentive. Uh, it's usually negative. Therefore, our consumer um, get deterred and we do something else. Okay. All right, let's skip this. And then number two, uh, life is all about trade-off. Uh, then nothing is free. You gotta pay something for it. So because of scarcity that we have, we don't have enough resources for everything. Um, we're gonna make some choices. Um, so economy will try to choose what to produce. Um, consumers will try to choose what to buy, given our scarce income. And then even you guys, uh, uh, sometime in the near future, you're gonna have a scarce day of time and then you have to make a choice about which class to study first, okay? Uh, so so this life, or this life, any life, anything we do, is all associated with scarcity and there's always a choice at the end, okay? Um, so because of the choice, there's something called opportunity cost. Um, so opportunity cost uh, is the value of the next best foregone alternative you must give up to um, to gain something else. That's called an opportunity cost. So, so for example, um, the guys, I tell you um, tomorrow for lunch, I'll pay for it. So if you come to lunch with me, it's free. Now, let's think about that scenario. So if I pay for your lunch tomorrow, so let's say we go to, uh, where do we go? So there is a there is a Chinese buffet of uh, 45, uh, it's called China Bear. Um, so let's suppose, I will tell you guys, tomorrow for lunch, come to lunch with me, I pay for it, and what is your cost? Now you might tell me that uh, you have to drive over there, right? Don't worry, um, I have a big Prius, I'm gonna fit any, everybody in the Prius, so I will drive. So what else do you, do you must give up? Um, there's a time, right? But anything else besides your driving cost and your time, what else do you must give up? Well, if you come to lunch with me tomorrow, um, then you won't be able to have lunch with your friends anymore. You won't be able to um, go to class anymore during that time. You wouldn't be able to go to work anymore. You wouldn't be able to study anymore during that time. So all the other opportunities you must give up to come to lunch with me that is called opportunity cost. So for everything you do, there is opportunity cost. Um, let me give you another scenario that's real life. Uh, let's think about LeBron James. Okay, so I mean, um, which which college did he go to? He didn't, right? He went directly from high school to MBA. Now let's suppose LeBron James actually went to college for four years. What would be his opportunity cost for doing so? Now, if you go to college instead of MBA for four years, then he must give up this opportunity of going to MBA for four years. And then which means four years salary, he must give up, which could be very, very expensive. So that, that's, that's his opportunity cost for going to um, college instead of MBA. And then for you guys, what is your opportunity cost now uh, when, you, when you're watching this video with us? Well, you, 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 if you're watching this video with us right now, uh, you cannot watch any videos on YouTube uh, for cat. You cannot watch uh, any YouTube, uh, YouTube videos on, I don't know, what else do you guys watch? So you cannot do anything else anymore, right? So those opportunities you must give up to spend time with me for this video, that's called opportunity cost.
Okay, so for everything you do, there is always opportunity cost. So this progression here, that because we have a scarcity, that we don't have enough resource, we must make choices. Then when you choose one thing over the other, and that's opportunity cost involved. Okay, so it's all connected. Oh, too much. Um, all right, so we talk about so so we can also talk, think about what is the opportunity cost of attending college. Well, you have your actual cost, uh, tuition and books. Uh, you have your opportunity you must give up, which is the uh, earnings you could be making when you work um, from working full time. But what about room and board? And what about the, the place you must stay at? Uh, would that be part of the opportunity cost of attending college? Uh, not necessarily, because for a room and board, um, you have to stay somewhere. You have to pay rent anyway, so that wouldn't be an extra cost of attending college. Okay. All right. So two kind of thinking. Uh, the first is economic thinking. Uh, that requires a purposeful evaluation of available opportunity to make the best decision possible. Now, in this class, in economics, we're going to make a big assumption. We're going to assume that every participant in the economy are all following this economic thinking. Now, it sounds pretty straightforward, right? It sounds like everybody's doing this, that everybody, when we make a decision, we all use purposely um, evaluation to, available all, to, to evaluate all available opportunities and then make the best choice available. So that sounds like what, every, uh, what everybody does all the time, but that's not the case because there's a difference between rational and emotional. So we're assuming everybody is all rational, but more than often, our participant in the economy can be very emotional. That we base on our decisions based on um, the stuff we cannot explain because it's our emotion, and then for emotion, it's hard to it's hard to evaluate. Emotions are also very difficult to um, to predict. Therefore, uh, for most part of this class and uh, for most part of all econ class, we're gonna ignore the um, the emotional part of the consumer behavior. Now, later on, once you guys study more economic class, we actually have um, um, have studies, have have actual classes that based on consumer behavior. Um, so game theory will be one. So that's the emotional part of the, the, the economic studies. But for now, we're going to assume, big assumption, we're going to assume everybody is all following this economic thinking, that we all make our decisions based on purposeful evaluation of all opportunities. And then for all this decision making process, uh, it's all based on marginal thinking that we compare what is our marginal benefit and our marginal cost. So if your marginal benefit is more than marginal cost, then we do it. But if your marginal benefit is less than marginal cost, then forget about it. We don't do that, we don't do that anymore. Okay, so for everything you do, we all try to compare what is our marginal benefit uh, with our marginal cost. Okay. Um, all right, so that's a that's a bad example. I don't want to talk about this, but let me give you another example. Uh, think about uh, think about PS4. Um, many of you guys do play games, um, and then you probably have a PS4 or Xbox One in the house. So uh, I want to think this way. I want you to think this way. Um, does anybody have two of the same console at home? That means do you have two PS4? Or two Xbox One or two Xbox 360. Um, probably not that many people, right? I mean, they might have two uh, of the same console in the house, but that's probably one for each person of the household, like one for you, one for your brother. But very rarely do you see people have two of the same console. The reason why we don't have two of the same console is because this marginal analysis over here that we're comparing our marginal benefit and our marginal cost. So if you buy a PS4 today, uh, it costs you probably what three hundred dollars for a PS4, right? So if let's say you buy our first PS4, for our first PS4, now this is our first PS4. So when you buy the first PS4, you can play game on it, you can watch movie with it, you can go online with it. So your marginal benefit, this is supposed to be an M, your marginal benefit is very high. Um, and then marginal cost um, is pretty low. It's only $300. So marginal benefit is more. And what do we do? We buy the first PS4. Now, for the second PS4, you already have one in the house. So you can already, you can already play game on it. You can, um, 
you can already um, watch movie on it, right? So if you buy the second PS, now it's it's nice to have second PS4, but we don't need it because the the actual benefit from second PS4 is not that high. But you still get some benefit out of it, but it's really just very very low. So a very low marginal benefit. Now marginal cost will still cost you three hundred dollars. So in this case here, your marginal cost is higher and marginal benefit is way lower. Now what do we do? We don't buy the second PS4. We only have one PS4, okay? So that's your marginal analysis. All right, uh, so next one, trade creates value. So trade is good. Um, and then another way to put it, that everybody everybody benefit from trade. Um, so first, know what's a market. Market is when you have buyers and sellers come together to exchange goods and service. That's called market. Now, traditionally, market they're uh, um, they're like your your Walmart, your your Target, your Kroger. Uh, so those would be a market. But now, uh, markets are over uh, moving virtually now, and then many of the biggest market out there, um, their market um, online. So a company like Amazon. That's a big market. That's a huge market. Uh, company like eBay. That's a huge market too. So, so for all those big market, um, for all those big online stores, there's there's still part of market because that's when the buyer and sellers come together virtually to exchange goods and service. Okay, but maybe not um, ex directly exchange goods and service uh, because if you just exchange goods and service, like a, I give you an apple, you give me a banana, uh, that's called a barter mm -hmm. system. Um, but for our market, most likely we're just changing money with school and service. Okay, so trade. Um, so trade is this voluntary, uh, voluntary exchange of good and service between two or more parties as trade. So I give you something, you give me something back in return. And trade is good. Um, trade is benefiting to all parties involved because nobody's forced to trade. Um, and then you guys, we, we don't we don't think it that often, but we all trade. I mean, pretty much for every day of the week, we all trade in our life. Um, let me give you a very clear example that you will know why you trade. Okay, so um, so unless you're vegetarian, um, everybody ate chicken before, right? <laughs> you all we all ate chicken before. All right, but think about this: how many of you guys actually killed a chicken before? Well, not that many people, right? We all ate a chicken before. We never killed a chicken before. So what happened? But well, we trade. Okay, so that's why um, we all benefit from trade. Okay, all right. Um, um, so we're gonna look at this diagram. It's called a circular flow diagram. So for the circular flow diagram, um, there are two market. You have the resource market, and you have the product market. So resource market, uh, they're the market where um, um, companies acquire their resources to produce good and service. So resources such as um, uh, labor, uh, such as uh, electricity, uh, water, coal, lumber, uh, any type of raw material, um, that's our resource, okay? Um, product is what the, what the final production is, so what do you produce? So uh, so there's a, a resource market, there's a product market. And then when you think about this, um, who's on demand side, who's on supply side, it depends on which market it is, okay? So um, so for example, for, for resource market, um, the demand side will be the companies, because the companies need the resource. We don't need the resource. We have the resource. I mean, think about labor, right? So for our consumers, we are the labor. Who need labor? Companies. So in the resource market, it's the company on the demand side and the household on the supply side. Now reverse it uh, in the product market. So once the company produces the product, who's on demand side? Consumers, household, on the demand side. But companies who produce them, they're on the supply side. Okay, so make sure you know which market we're talking about, and that's how we know which um, who's on demand side, who's on supply side. So for our diagram, um, it's a very simple diagram. So we have um, so in the product market, um, the good flows from firms to household, and then in the resource market, so like labor, um, the flow is from household to firms. Okay, so flow this way. But in the um, if you look at money. Money flows in opposite directions. Um, so, if you buy good directly, uh, you don't. There's no money involved. That's called barter. Um, so, individual trading goods and services exchange directly for what they want. Now, barter works, but it's inefficient. 
So let's suppose that let's suppose um, that um, I have an iPhone, and then somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, can I can I exchange exchange your iPhone with my uh, Galaxy?" Well, I wouldn't agree to it because you know I don't I don't want to have their Galaxy. I want my iPhone. So that change wouldn't work because both parties doesn't always want the want the stuff the other party has. So to for this to work, then we need this thing called a double coincidence of wants. So it just happens that both party wants what the, the good the other party has. That's called a double coincidence of wants. And that, that's what will make butter worse. But if this doesn't happen, if if you don't have this double coincidence coincidence of wants, then butter wouldn't exist. And nobody wanna trade anymore. Okay. Um, that is why you need money. <clears throat> With the existence of money, you can eliminate what is double coincidence, coincidence of one that's required for butter. So if somebody wants my iPhone, they can pay me money for it, and then I can use not the money I get from selling the iPhone to buy something else. Okay. Um, so the flow of money in the economy uh, is the opposite direction. So for money in the resource market, um, it flow from firm to household. So household will pay. I mean. Firms will pay household uh, for the income, for the wage, uh, for the rent, and then household. Once we have the money, we're going to spend it by buying goods and services in the product market from firms. So this is how the money flows. Okay, so the outer ring is for goods and service. How it flows on uh, the inner ring is how the money flows it's through a different market. Okay, all right. Um, so lastly, um, we're going to look at trade on the bigger picture. Uh, so why do we trade? Uh, because trade does allow um, companies or countries to specialize in what they're good at. And once you specialize in what you're good at, and then you can trade, and then between both parties involved, there'll be more good available in the economy. Uh, so this we're going to talk about in the later chapters. Okay, But for now, know something called a comparative advantage. So comparative advantage is a situation where individual companies can produce the good at a lower opportunity cost. Now, this is not a lower actual cost. This is a lower opportunity cost. Okay. So just no definitions for now. Uh, later on in the next couple of chapters, we'll go over more details about it. Okay. All right. So guys, that's it for this chapter. Uh, so very straightforward, uh, simple information, just the five foundations of economics. Um, so have any questions, uh, email me. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer questions. Okay, guys. All right. See you later. Bye-bye.